Well, hallelujah. <clears throat> this morning, I, uh, I titled my message, I Need Some Water. And to be perfectly honest with you, I, I, I hope that the, the title makes sense by the time the message is done. But the more I started looking at the text, I wasn't certain that that was the greatest title that I could have picked. But we're going to be reading out of uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. <coughs> Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. We're going to go through that passage of scripture and uh, we'll kind of like break some things down as we go and then we'll see where the Lord leads us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's start reading. It says in Revelation, well, you know what, before we, before we start reading, I just wanted to point out that when you read the first four chapters of the book of Revelation, what you realize is that the revelation, it, really the word revelation describes in the Greek, it's, it's apocalypsis, where we get the word apocalypse. And what it describes is, is ultimately talking about the unveiling or the revealing of Jesus. Amen. It's talking about to, to make something visible, to make it seen, to make it known, to expose it. And so really the whole book of Revelation is talking about the exposing or the visible manifestation of Jesus the Christ. And so when we read the entirety of Scripture as a whole, we realize that God has been from the beginning telling us through the scriptures that he was going to give us the Christ, which we know his name to be Jesus of Nazareth, uh, but that ultimately that the Christ was going to come and he was going to redeem mankind, he was going to reconcile man to God, and that ultimately in the last book of the Bible, what we realize is, is that it, this is a revelation or an unveiling and exposure, the visible manifestation of the one that God the Father promised, and see, to you and I, we can see him now because we have a relationship with him. The truth of the matter is, is that John said in John chapter 3, he spoke of the fact that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, nor can he enter into the kingdom of God. So if you've truly been born again, then you understand what I'm saying. The people of God are different than the world in the sense that when we received Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we heard the truth of the gospel and we believed by faith, that spiritual miracle took place on the inside where our spiritual eyes and understanding were opened and we were able to be able to see him in a spiritual sense. There's many people who still refuse to believe on the earth today. Some that you know in your family, some that are friends of yours, their eyes, their spiritual eyes are blinded to the truth. You can try to have conversations with them and I encourage you to do that. Uh, and sometimes it'll be very fruitful and you'll feel good about the conversations after you're done. Sometimes you'll feel frustrated after the conversations are done. They're never bad to have though, but there's coming a day when it's not going to be open for question anymore because there's going to be a visible appearance of the Lord. The, even the unbeliever, his mouth is going to be stopped. He's not going to be able to have an argument anymore. It's not going to be a hypothesis. It's not going to be a question. He's going to visibly return and people's eyes are going to see him and they're going to behold him. And that's really what the book of Revelation is describing. It's describing this unveiling, if you will, of Jesus the Christ. And so the way that this revelation is given is it's a revelation of Jesus Christ and is given by an angel to John while he's on the Isle of Patmos. And we know who John is. He wrote the Gospel of John. He was exiled to an island called Patmos. It was a Roman island that was utilized to uh, harbor prisoners. And John was placed on this island for his connection to preaching the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And while he's on this Isle of Patmos, he receives a vision from the Lord. And he begins to document all of this information that he sees. And the, the unveiling of what this angel is trying to explain to him or is explaining to him about Jesus. Now, one of the things that we're told if we would read the first chapter of the book of Revelation, and we're not going to go there, but I'm just going to let you know, is that when the way that Jesus is described in the first chapter is that. First off, it's descriptive of that there's seven candlesticks. That's the King James Version of the word, and it's probably not a good translation. It should have been translated lampstands because... The, because it's really connected to the menorah of the Jewish people, which wasn't a candlestick. A candlestick's made out of wax and it burns and melts and goes away. A lampstand is refilled with oil. So in, the, in some translations use lampstand. And in the seven lampstands, what we're told is, is that these lampstands, this light of these lamps, these represent the seven churches of God. 
The seven churches that are being uh, written to in this letter. That's really, if you read the first three chapters of Revelation, that's what it's, that's what's the correspondence is to the seven uh, churches and you know, people. It says the angels of the churches, and I'm not trying to get all technical. I didn't even plan on talking about all this, but the word in the Greek is angelos, and it can be translated as either messenger or angel. And so, some people say that it was written specifically to pastors uh, of the churches. I I say that nah, it might have been written to some literal pastors having to do with those churches, but these churches represent the whole church age. If that makes sense. And so I do believe also that, that, that it's representative of angels in the spiritual realm that were authorities over these, these churches. And so, but nevertheless, the, the way that this correspondence goes is it speaks to the fact that there, that these churches are represented as lampstands and that the son of man, which is Jesus is in the midst of them. Okay, And so the revelation of how Jesus is described is that he's in the midst of the churches and the churches are light. If you actually, if you would go uh, real quick to, before we get into Revelation uh, chapter uh, three, I would like you to go to uh, Matthew chapter five, verse 16. And real quick, I would like to uh, just talk about that in that particular passage, Jesus just said something real simple. It, actually go to, um, go to. Go to verse 15 first. I'm sorry, go to verse 14. <laughs> it says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Go to the next verse. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candle... But, but on a candlestick and gives light unto all that are in the house. Next word. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. You can go back to Revelation three. The point that I wanted to make is this, is that Jesus is the son of man. He's the he is the purpose that this letter is written or this book is written to expose him, to reveal him to a lost and a dying world. And he's he's represented in this letter as the one that's in the midst of the lampstands, the one that's in the midst of the candlestick, which <laughs> depicts the glowing of light or the emission of light. Now, that's the end of the story for the church age. That, that's what this whole letter is about. It's telling us about how God's going to wrap it all up. What we just read was the beginning of Jesus revealing himself to those that were going to be willing to listen. This has to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus sat on that mountaintop and he preached a message that scholars called the Beatitudes. And he began to introduce to the citizenry of his kingdom what it looked like and the difference between what those citizens looked like versus the citizens of the world. And one of the things that he said was, you are the light of the world. Now, we understand that Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, was the light that God the Father gave to this darkened world. But what Jesus is telling the, the, the people that are listening to him while he's preaching on the mount is that they're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. The churches are depicted in the book of Revelation as the light that emits in the midst of darkness. And so the whole idea of what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that God had, Jesus has uh, announced to us that you and I have a purpose. Our light has a purpose. The, the church's light has a purpose to the darkness that's in the world. And the purpose is that we would reveal to a lost and dying world that, God, that there's a real God. Amen. That there's a real God who has a plan. And that he wants to manifest and reveal himself to them so that they also could have a relationship with him. And so we have a clear purpose as the body of Christ. To, to emit that light to a midst of, in the midst of a lost and a dying world. At the same time, the body of Christ is made up of individual believers. Each one of us has the light of God as the Christ lives on the inside of us through his Holy Spirit. And we emit that light to the lost and dying world. Amen. And the church as a body goes as individual believers are walking uh, with the Lord or are sometimes moving further away. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this, the spiritual condition of the individuals that are within the midst of the church affect the overall light that's reflected to the, in the midst of the lost and dying world. That, I believe, is the essence of what this specific part of Revelation where it speaks to the church of Laodicea 
is speaking to. Amen. Many scholars would also tell you, just real quick, that Laodicea, well, first off, it is the last church that's addressed. And many people believe, and even uh, Brother Swagger uh, had written it in his commentary, that each one of these churches represent a specific time frame within the church age. But not only that, each one has certain characteristics that have been existent throughout the entirety of the church age. But what we end up, if La as Laodicea's position is the very last church, the seventh of the seven, is that it represents the end times of the condition of the church in the midst of the end times because it's the bookend at the end of the church. Now, I will tell you also on the front end, just like Jesus preached on the Mount of, I'm just, as I'm thinking about this, I feel like the Lord's showing me this because I feel like the Lord's showing me this this morning. As Jesus is preaching the Beatitudes, the first church, Ephesus, he tells them, you left your first love. And he said, and if you don't correct it, then I'm going to remove your candlestick. So he's talking about is directly related to light and the fact that in the first when he first approached the church from that mountainside, he told them, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world and you don't hide your light. Amen. Mm -hmm. And he told Ephesus, return to your first works, return to your first love. And he connected it to light. And in a similar situation, the book of the church of Laodicea is connected to their works. All right. So we're back at Revelation chapter three. Verses 14 through 22, it says unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Uh, you know, before we move any forward, I just wanted to point out that as I was reading again and looking through this, I keep seeing terminology and words that are in these verses of scripture that describe the very thing that I've already talked to you about. A revealing, a manifestation, a making visible. Ultimately, what we're making, what's being made visible is, yes, Jesus, and through that, the work of God. Amen. And so what I need you to know is this: He's describing himself, what the angel or the angel is describing Jesus, or Jesus is actually talking right here, I believe, that revealing who he is. He's the faithful and the true witness. That word witness there is martyr in the Greek. And what it really describes, that's where we get our word martyr for those that have died. But what the word witness literally means is one that's even brought to the stand to give a testimony to the facts. And so what's going on already is, is that we're seeing uh, an illusion or a, an alluding to of the fact that the facts need to be spoken of. The facts of the kingdom of God. The facts regarding the Father. Jesus is the faithful and the true witness. Every last one of us in this room want to be faithful and true to the kingdom of God. To the plan of God. But the reality of it is, is that he is the faithful and the true witness of God. And that whenever the eyes see him, whether it be now spiritually or then physically, it's going to give testimony to the fact of God's plan. He was the beginning of the creation of God. It doesn't mean that he was the first created being. As some would say, it means that creation issued forth out of him, that he was the one who began the creation process. He says right here, I know your works. So, so you see right there, it's connected straight to their works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because you say I am enriched and increased with goods and have need of nothing and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. Again, this word appear describes the fact of something being made visible, being made manifest. And specifically what it's talking about right here is nakedness. And there you can't, you would never convince me. I, I didn't go back and read what anybody else had to say, but you'll never convince me that this isn't referring back even to the whole garden incident. It's, he's specific, speaking specifically about nakedness, He's speaking specifically about it being made manifest. See, through the fall of Adam and Eve, they, physically they weren't wearing clothing before. We've talked about this, that 
many scholars believe they would have been covered with the glory of God. We can't prove that. But whatever happened in that situation that took place, now their nakedness was made visible to them. They were made aware of that situation. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's really talking about when it's all said and done, you don't want to be standing there naked is what he's saying. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may be able to see. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that there's a lot of times whenever people could theoretically be naked, but they wouldn't even know it. And, and so that's what he's saying. He's saying that you need to be able to see all of these things that I'm talking about. As many as I love, I rebuke. You know what I would like to, I would like to let you know that that's another word that describes. Could you go real quick to John chapter 16, verse 8? That that word rebuke literally means to bring to light or to expose. And the, what I wanted you to see in John chapter 16, verse 8, is that the person who is integral in exposing is the Holy Spirit. Because that's what Jesus was talking about right here. When he was talking about the fact that he was about to leave, he said, it's expedient that I go away. The word expedient means it's beneficial, it's useful, it's a good thing that I go away. Because if I don't go away, he won't come. Talking about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He says when he does come, he will reprove. That word reprove is the exact, the exact same word in the Greek as this word rebuke that we're talking about in the book of Revelation. It will, he will reprove or rebuke, if you will, which ultimately means to bring to light or to expose to the world sin, righteousness, and judgment. You can go back to Revelation 3. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that the work of Jesus the Christ, along with the presence of the Holy Spirit upon the earth and the light that is resonant from Jesus in the midst of the body of Christ, but is moving through the ages of human history and is revealing. See, because the Holy Spirit works through the church. The Holy Spirit works through you as a vessel. And that light that is in you emanates out of you. And the Holy Spirit takes that truth of the gospel and he begins to expose to the world around us the truth and begins and, and begins to expose to them where they're where they're wrong. Jesus is wanting the church to know, I need you, I, I desire to use you. This is how this plan has been. And so those that I love, I rebuke and I chasten. He says, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. That's descriptive of eating supper or communion. It's a descriptive of a, an intimate relationship with the Lord and he with me. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says and to the churches. You know, Laodicea geographically was, was located on what was called the Roman road. And I know I've drawn my little map for y'all multiple times. And if you could imagine in your head, some of you probably can, where you have Israel to the right. And whenever I would draw that little isthmus of land called Asia Minor, that's where all these seven churches were located. Basically it was Greece and Rome would be to the west. Asia Minor was up here. And then you had Israel over here and Babylon over there. So that little isthmus of land was known. That's where the Roman road went through. It connected the west, Rome and Italy, to the east, which was Babylon. It was very, Laodicea was very strategically located on that, that road. It, lit, it sat in something called the Lycus Valley. It was a plush valley that had rivers that flowed through it. And it was a very... Uh, prosperous city. It had, and, and the reason that I bring all this up is because the things that Jesus said to the church, archaeologically, there has been documentation that found that the city was engaged in industry that directly or, or things connected to it, civilly or whatever the case, that connected itself directly to the words that Jesus was saying. And so Jesus was was approaching them and speaking to them based upon things that they knew. I know of no other, there was no other discussion that Jesus had with any of these churches that is, it had some information like that in some of the other ones, but none quite like 
the church of Laodicea. And so some of the things having to do with Laodicea, it was strategically located, but it had a banking center that was full of gold. And so it was a very rich and prosperous city. The, re the way that they had become so prosperous was because they had particular type of sheep that produced a very glossy black wool. And it was so well known that, that they, they, they grew it. I say grew it. They raised these sheep there or goats or whatever they were. They, and they also distributed this wool all over the place. And, uh, and in addition to that, there was a medical school there. And in this medical school, they, they produced this. They also had this element that was near or this mineral called Phrygia. It was a powdered substance. And at the medical school, they would take this Phrygia that they had. And they would grind it into powder and they, could, they would make an eye salve with it. And so the city was well known for having this eye salve that would cure common ailments to the eye. Uh, now, so all of these things are directly connected to things that Jesus is, is speaking to them about. And so some of those things having to do with the first thing, uh, one, another thing I wanted to tell you is that in AD 65, there was an earthquake. There, once again, archaeological information found that said about AD 65, some people are a little bit divided on the actual time, but that's not what's important. An earthquake destroyed the city. I mean, it was completely ravaged. And Imperial Rome offered, once again, documentation that shows that this happened. Imperial Rome, the emperor from, from Italy, offered to help rebuild the city because it was such an important part of uh, commerce and things of that nature. But in the documentation, it showed that the inhabitants or the citizens of Laodicea said, no, that's not necessary. It's not necessary that you help us. We have what we need within our own community to rebuild ourselves. And so what they were was a very self-sufficient city because of the things that they already had. Now, so with us understanding that and realizing it, we need to, we need to know that that's part of what Jesus is talking about. Because the society that the church had lived in was beginning to affect the church itself. And the society of the city that surrounded the church, it was very self-sufficient. It was very materialistic. It was very powerful. It was very rich. And it didn't feel as though it needed help from anybody else. In a spiritual sense, this happens to believers very commonly. And especially in the modern church today, we've become confused into thinking that we understand what the blessings of God are based upon the things that we see. And the reality of it is, is that many times that's not the case at all. And that's the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, talking about material possessions. Even today, material possessions have a way of blinding people. We, whenever we flip through the channels, and I know I talk about this sometimes, but to the untrained eye, and maybe that's not for us in here. Maybe I've already said it too many times for you to be confused in that way. But for the untrained eye, when you begin to look at a church that's thriving with people, that looks as though financially they're being blessed. I don't know about you, but for a long time in my early Christian years, I had been convinced by the people that were preaching, by the people, by just in conversation with people, that a church that was blessed financially was obviously in the will of God. The, what I'm trying to say is this, is that have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody about Joel Osteen's church? I said it on camera, I, and I'm not, I don't even feel a little bit bad about it. I, I just, I just, I'm just wondering, have you ever tried to have a conversation with anybody about Joel Osteen's church and the message that Joel Osteen preaches? Okay. If you've ever listened to Joel Osteen's message, I mean, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but he's not preaching the gospel. At best, he's a motivational speaker trying to make people feel good about their situation. He's not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He might mention Jesus, but he's not really talking about the gospel at all. Yet, if you look at his church, it's packed. I mean, I don't know. Last time I heard anything was several years ago. It was like 25,000 people. I went to the original church that the daddy had at least on one or two occasions when I went and visited my dad in Houston. I didn't know any better. But since that time, since his dad died and he took over, they had to buy the compact center. I mean, I went and saw ZZ Top in that thing. They, you know, they, bought this, they bought this whole compact center and turned it into a church and pack it out. And so my, my point is, is that you're going to, whenever, whenever I've engaged people in conversation about that type of ministry, they look at me like I'm a fool and they're, and they're like, dude, 
surely they're doing something right. Look at the blessing that's in the midst of this church. I'm here to tell you, let us not be confused. Just because people are materially blessed does not mean that they're really of the Lord, right? Amen. The fact Amen. of the matter is, is that the most powerful, richest people in the world are those that reject the notion that God is sovereign to begin with. And we see that this begins to affect Christians. That many times they believe that because they are blessed materially, that they're doing okay with the Lord. And sometimes whenever the Lord begins to bless people materially, they have a difficult time serving the Lord. I never have really understood that part of it. And I thank God that that's just not a problem that I've struggled with. And what, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I got to tell you, and some of y'all in here know you people's names will pop in your head as I talk to you about it. There's been people that I know that when they didn't have a job, when they were struggling with the Lord or whatever the case, they, they and I mean, this is going way back to even two churches ago, whenever I was like 20 years old, I would, there were people that were in the church that I was doing ministry with. They didn't have a job. I mean, these are people that really never really worked much to begin with, to be fair to them. Um, they never had, they didn't have a job. And I mean, they were all far for God. And then all of a sudden they get a job and they have to go to work. And it's almost like they can't do both things. They can't work and also go serve the Lord. And sometimes people are so caught up in, in their material possessions or, you know, now that they have a job and, and they actually have some money flowing, it's almost like they forgot the Lord that, that blessed them and brought them to the place to begin with. And so the only point that I'm trying to make with all of that is this, is that sometimes we have a mindset. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God doesn't bless his people because I believe that he does. But sometimes we have a mindset that material possessions are a direct connection to the hand of God being in the midst of our life. And what I'm here to tell you is that what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea is, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, there's no question in my mind that what Jesus is talking about is, is that the riches of the kingdom. You know, there was a time that the last church I went to, there was this guy that was, you ever seen how sometimes when you go to churches, they got... Sometimes, I mean, I'm just being real. Sometimes some kind of strange, different, quirky people will show up from time to time where there was this kind of quirky guy that had showed up and uh, he was a little bit different and he would say some kind of strange things. But one time he said something and I was like, man, that's the best thing I heard. It. I hadn't heard a preacher say something that good and, and I don't know how long. He said, the currency of the kingdom is faith. And one of the things that I, that as I was writing this, I remember that guy saying that 12 years ago. The currency of the kingdom is faith. And what Jesus is talking about when he says, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. He's talking about being rich in faith. And what, if we look at 1 Peter 1, 7, it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with the fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Once again, we're talking about the manifestation of Jesus, the revealing of him, and that when he comes, this is the condition of our faith. See, great faith has to be tried. The word tried literally means to make glow, to be ignited by fire and purged of dross. Each and every one of us in here, we've, we've heard the gospel. We've put our faith in Christ. We love him. We wouldn't be here on this cold morning if we didn't love God and didn't want to serve him. Amen. And the reality of it is, though, is that our faith is going to have to be. Jesus says that if you want to be rich according to the kingdom's currency, then you need to buy gold that's been tried by fire. The question is, has your faith been tried by fire? And if it hasn't, I can assure you that if you stick around long enough in some way, shape, or form, your faith will continue to be tried by fire. You might be in the midst of a trial right now that's trying your faith, and even whenever this trial is over, you're going to think, oh man, I got through that one. That was the, that was the roughest trial I'll ever have. Guess what? It's not over with. You will continue to be tested and put through, through the fire until you see the Lord. Lord, amen, because there's always going to be some level of dross that's on the inside of us, impurities and imperfections that the Lord is desiring to get rid of. So the first point that I wanted to make was this, is that don't get caught up in material possessions. Don't get caught up in thinking that just because you're being blessed or, you know, things are going your way in that situation and everything's okay. Laodicea had become complacent. They thought that because they were rich, that they weren't in need of anything. But what the Lord was saying is, no, that's not the case. You need 
to be tried. You need to be, you, you need your faith to be tried by fire. Amen. But the second thing that I wanted to point out to you was there was a verse where it, and it's talking about nakedness. He said, I need you to buy white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. You know, all the black wool in Laodicea could not cover up the nakedness of the situation that had taken place. I made allusion to it already, but that this reminds me of the fig leaves of the garden incident. The, the, the black wool couldn't cover them up, the, and the fig leaves in the garden couldn't cover them up. Uh, and in both cases, there was a dependency on self. In other words, the fig leaves were, they were dependent upon their work of their own hands to cover themselves. Laodicea in their complacency and their self-sufficiency, like the society around them, felt like they were clothed. But Jesus speaks right to the heart of the matter. All of that clothing is not going to cover you in a spiritual sense. He's getting to the bottom of it. He's getting to the heart of the situation. It has to do with a spiritual problem that's taking place. In Matthew 17, verse 2. Whenever I started thinking about garments, because see what he said right here was he said that he was offering white raiment that they would be clothed. And I mean, if you've done any study about white raiment, then you know that it represents the righteousness of God. It represents the righteousness of the saints. But I thought to myself as I was thinking about this passage, the first time I remembered white raiment in the New Testament. And I remembered this situation that took place where Jesus was transfigured before them. And it talks about, it says, that, and he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. Now, I can tell you that the word transfigured is where we get the word metamorphosis. It means that that which is, you know, when you see, we use the word metamorphosis for a caterpillar. That a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. But in reality, what was really on the inside of the caterpillar was the genes to be a butterfly and that it finally was manifest. What happened on the Mount of Transfiguration on that day was the deity of Jesus, the godness, if you could let me say it like that, that was on the inside of him shone forth that day. So much so, so powerful that it began to turn. It turned his his raiment white. Uh, in, in, in the Mark passage, it talks about it was more white than any fuller on earth could have gotten it. I never knew what a fuller was. I mean, I've shared this with y'all before. You may not remember, though. But in the Old Testament, it talked about fuller soap. So I'm thinking the little bit of research that I've done that a fuller, according to old King James language, had to do with somebody that would be a modern day dry cleaner. Somebody that had to do with materials or clothing to get it clean. No fuller on earth could have gotten Jesus's clothing as white as what those clothes showed on that day. In other words, it wasn't a physical cleanliness. It was a spiritual cleanliness. And it was coming from on the inside of him. And just as he was the light that was given in the midst of a darkened world to mankind, Jesus, hallelujah, is the righteousness of God manifest on earth. And it's his righteousness ultimately that's going to be given to us. Black wool of Laodicea is not going to cover mankind spiritually. Fig leaves in the work of man's hands is not going to cover man spiritually. You and I need to get our covering from the Lord. He's offering white raiment. Amen. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 8. I wanted to show you because there's multiple places in the book of Revelation specifically that talk about you and I having white raiment. You and I being clothed with right, the righteousness of God. Amen. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, you and I already know that, and hopefully we know this, that any righteousness that's attributed to the saints of God is not a righteousness that's inherently their own, Amen. but it's a righteousness that was given to them as a gift from the one who was righteous. And we understand that the transaction, I'm about to make the point again, the transaction that allows that righteousness to be given to you as a gift took place at the cross. There's no question about it. If you can scroll down a little bit to verse 13, it says right here in Revelation 19, 13 and 14, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood 
His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I want you to know that it talks, it, it requires work, at least in a physical sense, for clothing to be made white and clean. It requires work. I mean, we talked about it already. The fuller, the fuller soap. And he worked so hard. Actually, literally the word means to tease or to agitate. I don't know. Back in the old days, I, one of my favorite movies a long time ago, I probably shouldn't tell you this, it was called Far and Away. And in this movie, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman were trying to prospect some land. I don't know why I thought that the best part, one of the best parts of the movie was she was, she was real rich and he was like a poor boy. And he was just kind of like a tough little scrappy guy. And she was trying to wash her clothes. You ever seen how they wash clothes? And she was twirling it around in the soapy water. And he's like laughing at her like, you don't even know how to wash your own clothes. So he grabs the, the thing and he starts hitting it with some soap. And then he agitates it on the thing. And he pulls it and he's like schooling her on how to wash clothes. For you and I, it's difficult for us to wrap our mind around how they used to wash clothes back then. But it was a much more difficult job than what it is today. It required a lot of agitation. It required a lot of work is the main point that I'm trying to make. And so, but what I need you to know is this, is that the white linen and the white raiment of the saints that covers them and makes them righteous in the eyes of God, it required work. But it's not the work of the fuller. The, the fuller soap couldn't get it done. The work of the that, that allowed you and I to be clothed with white and righteousness is spoken of right here in Revelation 19, 13. The reason that you and I can be clothed in white raiment is because of the fact that he is clothed in a vesture that's been dipped in blood. The Hallelujah. The vesture that's been dipped in blood is representative of his sacrifice on Calvary. It's representative of the fact that he took your sin upon him. And if you keep looking in the scriptures, you will find it time and time again that the work of Calvary is what allows God to be able to have a relationship Amen. with you and I. Amen. So I need you to know that number one, don't be get caught, don't get caught up in spiritual material possessions. Number two, don't be found naked. But the only way that you're going to be clothed upon that's going to have any kind of meaning or significance in the kingdom of God is that if we be clothed with the righteousness of the Lord. Amen. Number the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was spiritual blindness because he said. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might be able to see. See, the problem with material possessions and spiritual nakedness is that in both cases, people are spiritually blind and can't see that there's a problem to begin with. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, you don't really have to go there, but there's a story about a blind man, and he was born that way. I don't know if y'all remember the story or not, but the way that Jesus healed him was a little bit, when I say strange, I'm not trying to say that what the Lord did was strange, but to the, when you look at it on the surface, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because I mean, Jesus could have just spoken a word, amen, be healed, but that's not what he did. He chose instead to grab some dust from the ground and he spit in it and he began to, he began to knead it together to make clay out of it. And the Bible says he put the clay on the man's eyes. Now we know I, you know, and I've shared this with you before that Jesus did that purposefully because it was actually the Sabbath and he purposefully, there was a law that the Pharisees had come up with that said you weren't allowed to knead clay on the Sabbath. And, and so he really purposefully broke the Sabbath because they had turned it into something that he didn't break the Sabbath. Let me, let me clarify what I'm trying to say here. He didn't break the Sabbath because Jesus perfectly kept the law, but he broke their traditions and their interpretation of what the Sabbath was because they were all wrong and they were laying heavy burdens upon the people. And so what Jesus did was he chose to do that on the Sabbath. But, but what we're focused on is, is the fact that he put that clay on that man's eyes and then he told him to go to the pool of Siloam and to wash it off. I don't really know. I kind of looked into it and couldn't really find for sure where he was to begin with. We don't know how far away the pool of Siloam was, but I get the impression that it wasn't just right there. So there had to be some type of a journey that he embarked upon where not only is he blind now, but he's got some clay over the midst of his eyes. And he wants to be able to see. He believes that Jesus can bring healing to him. And, and he begins this journey of walking to this pool to wash this off. The point that I'm trying to make to you is this, is that many times, we, well, not many times, all the time, you and I need spiritual vision. We need to be able to see. Amen. We need to be able to see clearly what the Lord is yeah. speaking to us. And I just got to tell you that 
this is a journey of faith. Sometimes we can't see as clearly. We don't understand exactly what's going on in the midst of our life. We can't see the future, but we know who holds the future. We know who can see for us. And the question is, are we going to be able to be willing to blindly be led by him, to trust him, and to walk in the midst of that journey as he leads us and guides us to there? The church of Laodicea was spiritually blind. I got to tell you, though, all the Phrygia, that powdered substance, in Laodicea from that medical school could not allow their eyes to be open. But the reality of it is, is that what they needed was for the Lord to minister to them and to give them eyes that would be opened. The next thing that I wanted to talk to you about had to do with the fact that Jesus said, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. You know, I didn't mention this to you, but... In every scenario that we talked about before, Laodicea was independent, meaning financially they were more than capable, right? I mean, we talk, I told you the story about the earthquake. They had the black wool. They could cover themselves. They had the eye salve. They could heal their own eye ailments. They had um, material possessions. They had gold. They had a banking center. They had gold. They had all of these things. But one thing that they didn't have, they didn't have their own water source. That's other archaeological documentation that shows that there was an aqueduct system that brought water from two nearby cities. Colossae was kind of like to their right, and this other city, Hierapolis, was to their left. Hierapolis had hot springs. Colossae had cold water. It, it, but th and this is the interesting thing. By the time that the water would have made it to Laodicea, in either case, the water wouldn't have been cold nor hot. It would have been lukewarm. So as beautiful as hot water is to be able to soak in and be able to mix certain things whenever you're cooking or making teas or whatever. I would imagine they had teas back then. Uh, by the time it gets to Laodicea, it's not hot. And as good as cold water is on a hot day to take a drink of cold water, by the time it gets from Colossae, it's not hot anymore. It's both cases, it's lukewarm. And he's, Jesus was specifically speaking to the works of the church. I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out. Truth be told is that the spiritual condition of the believer is a direct reflection on the work that is accomplished. First off, in their life, but also within the church's life. And I think that we could agree on that. I mean, what I mean by that is this, is that you've seen in your own life times whenever you were on fire for the Lord and you saw yourself almost in the, just speaking about God more often, right? Then at times whenever you weren't as close to the Lord, you couldn't get an amen here. I mean, you don't have to shout me out. You don't have to shout it out at me, but I just, I see y'all shaking y'all's hands like, yeah, I'm with you, preacher. I know it's cold and we're getting warm and probably tired, but you know what I'm talking about, that that there, there's a connection to that. And, and that's what the Lord's talking about. Spiritually, they were... They were in a condition that they weren't on fire for the Lord. They weren't fervent for the Lord. And because of that, it was affecting the work of God. It was affecting what, what was being accomplished out of their hearts and out of their lives. There was nothing that they could do about this water situation. They couldn't, back then, they couldn't put a heater on one pipe and make it hot when it got there. And they couldn't put some kind of refrigeration mechanism on the other one to make it cold. They didn't have a nice machine. They, they couldn't do anything about the water. Uh, and, and you know, what I got to tell you is this, is that in your and our spiritual life, we really can't change the, the temperature of our spiritual life. And what I'm trying to say is this, we need some help from an external Amen. source. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We need some help from the Lord. We need God to intervene in the midst of our situation to eat, to make us hot again. Amen. And you know, there, when I was thinking of this, because it had to do with water, I, I was thinking about two places in the gospel of John. And you remember the other night, whenever we were talking, I mentioned to you that when you're doing Bible study, that you should always try to, you may not remember, but I said, if you're looking at a word or a concept, then you should try to go back and see other things that the same author had written, right? That the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes you want to look in the same book if you can, but sometimes like in somebody like John, he wrote four different pieces of work. Like the Holy Spirit through him wrote four different pieces of work, three epistles. We'll teach the last one tonight and the gospel of John. And so he's talking about water throughout the, and oh, I'm sorry, five. 
the book of Revelation, the one that we're talking about this morning. John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. He wrote five. Ne really, next to Paul, off the top of my head, he wrote more letters or pieces of information than any other writer in the New Testament. But in the Gospel of John, talking about water, uh, he's mentioned living water twice. In John chapter 4, verse 14, if Manuel could go to that real quick, he, he said this, he said this to the Samaritan woman. Y'all remember that story? She was thirsty, physically. She was thirsty, really spiritually. She was just going to get some water to take care of her business for the day. But Jesus introduced her to what she really needed. Jesus told her, whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into Amen. everlasting life. Amen. Amen. If you go to um, John chapter 7, verse 38, he said this. He was, it was during one of the feasts and he stood up and he spoke to the crowd and he said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I told you this morning that really that what I titled the message was I need a drink of water. And what I mean, you know, the truth of the matter is, is this, is that when we're thirsty physically, we need something external to, 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 to take care of the problem that we're dealing with. Right now, this morning, what we're talking about is spiritual thirst. We're talking about a spiritual, a, a situation in our spiritual life where we're, where we're lacking, where we're on a decline, where we're connecting how the church can look like the church of Laodicea in the sense that we become complacent, we become self-reliant, we become self sufficient. We don't realize the things that we need from God. And what Jesus is saying is, is that I need you to, to buy gold that's been tried by the fire. I need you to look at the raiment that I'm offering. It's my righteousness that I'm giving you. I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be, you'd be better off being either hot or cold. And really, we used to always say that Cold represented just don't even serve the Lord. People, I think, have taken that and done some liberty with it. And hot being, that's how really God wants us. I really think that there's more to it than that. Like, in other words, you think that Jesus would say to someone, I wish that you were either cold or hot. In other words, you think that Jesus would say to somebody, I wish that you were cold and wouldn't even serve me at all. Jesus wouldn't say that. I think the idea has to do with usefulness. In other words, cold water has a use. Hot water has a use. Lukewarm water, spit it out because it's not of any use. I think what Jesus is trying to explain to us is this, is that I desire that you would be useful for me and that you would be useful for my, because I see your works. And you're neither hot, you're neither cold. You're not useful for what it is that I'm doing. I wish you were hot or cold. And so he's asking us to, to buy of him, to receive of him that which he offers. It just so happens that Laodicea didn't have their own water source. And what Jesus taught, I mean, what John, the Holy Spirit through John talks about in the Gospel of John, of what Jesus was speaking of is water was connected to the Holy Spirit. Amen. You, you need living water on the inside of you. Amen. And what you and I need to know is this, is that when we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to be resident on the inside of us. But listen to me, you can have more of the Holy Spirit, amen, than, than what you first got on your down payment. I'm here to tell you this morning, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, I'm just here to tell you right now, you might not be, you, you may not, you know, you're like, oh, I don't know about all that speaking and tongue stuff. Look. Quit stressing about speaking in tongues and seek the Lord. Amen. Seek the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, I want more of you. Baptize me with your Holy Spirit and fill me up. Amen. Fill me up and make me hot. Make me useful for the things of God. What we're saying is, is that we need some kind of external intervention. We need the Lord intervening in the midst of our lives. Amen. And the way that we're going to get that is we're going to have to ask for it. We're going to have to ask God to intervene in the midst of our lives. And so we need the Holy Spirit doing that and working in our lives. And the Holy Spirit always works through what Jesus has already done. Yeah. He's already done it. Jesus has done his work. Right. He's done what he's done. Amen. He died on the cross yeah. and he connected us back to the Father through the Spirit. Yes. Amen. The Spirit's like water for your thirsty soul. Yeah. The Spirit's like water to, to bring life to something that was dead. Amen. Okay. Holy Spirit, we need more of you. At the end of the letter, towards the end of the letter, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke. He exposes. 
The Holy Jesus says that he brings correction into people's lives. He rebukes, he chastens. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So Jesus closes out this towards the bottom, back at the, the end of this particular correspondence with saying that he's outside knocking. I would go out there and knock on the door, but I'd probably lock myself out and be too cold. But Jesus is outside the, the door. He's knocking. And the picture is, you know, many preachers have used this as more of an evangelical type message to reach out to unbelievers. Jesus is knocking on your door. And there is truth to that. I don't know if you've ever felt Jesus knocking on your door before, but I know I have. There is some truth to that. But what he's talking about right here, he's talking about the church. He's outside and he's knocking. He wants to come in. He wants to have communion and relationship. But, but specifically, look what he says. He says, if any man hear my voice. Once again, the church, the body of Christ is made up of individuals. And Jesus is wanting to have an individual relationship with each and every Amen. one of us. Amen. And he's standing at the door and he's knocking on the hearts of those that already know him. He's knocking on the hearts of those that already know him and have a relationship with him. He's crying out to them and he's saying that if you will hear my voice, if you will repent, I will come into you and I will sup with you. I will have communion with you. Amen. The intervention of God moving in our lives all starts with us realizing that we must repent. And the picture here is that Jesus on the outside, he's desiring to come in. He's knocking, but once again, he's speaking to individuals. He rebukes and brings correction into the lives of his people and he desires that they would listen and respond. And when they do, he opens blinded eyes, he covers them with righteousness, and he gives them strength for their faith.